Warning. Listening to this show may result in increased levels of inspiration, motivation, and innovation. Side effects can include the immediate urge to take massive action to build a better business and life for yourself and others. You've been warned. Welcome to Influencers Radio with your host, Jack Mize. And welcome back to another episode of Influencers Radio. You know, starting a new business can be exciting. And while it's easy to get hyper-focused on your vision of serving customers as soon as possible, it's important not to let this excitement distract you from planning your business properly. Because the way you legally structure your business will have an impact on everything from day-to-day operations to how you pay taxes and your personal exposure to legal risk. Deciding how to structure your business can be overwhelming, confusing, and even a little bit scary, but it's a necessary part of launching any successful business. Well, my guest today is Deanne Chase. She is a business attorney and strategic business growth expert and founder of Chase Law Group. And she works with entrepreneurs and business owners to create proper legal structures that form the foundation for a successful business. Deanne has a remarkable ability to cut through the uncertainty and confusion when it comes to legal issues, and she is passionate about sharing her wealth of legal knowledge to help entrepreneurs and business owners to avoid costly mistakes and lawsuits. Deanne, welcome to Influencers Radio. Hi, thank you for having me. Well, I've got to say that, uh, you know, when it comes to Uh, the legal side of starting a business. And I've, you know, talked to so many business owners, entrepreneurs, and it always seems to be that one thing that they kind of scrunch up their nose at that they really don't want to deal with, but it's something that they've got to deal with. And I've got to be honest, it seems to me to be extremely tempting to use one of the many online, you know, do-it-yourself legal services to set up a business. You see the ads all the time, TV, radio, on the web, but I'm sure, and they don't talk about it, but I'm sure that that has to come with a lot of unknown pitfalls. So I'd like to start with understanding, you know, what are business owners really facing when they they go that route? Yeah, I think um, I saw an ad not too long ago that said that millions of of people are uh, going to these online DIY resources to start their business or to, you know, uh, put together their estate plan. And, um, and every time I hear that, you know, it, it's just, it's very scary. It's really the, um, the old motto, you don't know what you don't know. Right. And so that's really what we're seeing on our side of things is, Um, You know, we work with entrepreneurs and business owners on a daily basis, and many, many of them are coming to me, I'd say almost all of them come to me, either having researched and considered using one of those services and just realized that, that they, you know, that they shouldn't be using something like that on their own if, if they, they can't kind of work through some of the questions, or they've come to me, they have already use those services either to form their own business entity, like they're, you know, a corporation or an LLC or to file their own trademarks. And, and I'm sure one of the reasons, I guess probably one of the biggest reasons um, to do that is cost. And I, and I want to get into that. Um, But first uh, I, I want to establish that, you know, a lot of people, think that, you know, once they do that, once they set up that business structure, once they choose that LLC or corporation or whatever, that, um, you know, it's no backsies, right? That, 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 that's what they're, they're stuck with. Uh, how difficult is that to, to, to change that uh, after the, the fact? Is it kind of complicated and messy or is it not as scary as people may think it is? Well, it depends. <laughs> um, it, it really depends. I have had um, individuals, uh, for example, um, professionals such as, you know, chiropractors, physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists. Um, 
I've had people come to me, those types of professionals, and they have, for example, an LLC structure. Uh, The problem is that in many cases, and particularly here in the state of California where I'm located, a professional cannot practice a profession through an LLC. So at that point in time, we are in a position of either dissolving, canceling that LLC and refiling a new entity or um, or filing paperwork to convert the entity to, in, in those instances, actually, those types of professionals need to have a professional corporation. So um, it it can be a little bit tricky sometimes, but but it is doable. And sometimes it's as simple as filing some documents with the Secretary of State to change the business structure. Um, and then, of course, that that can impact other matters as well with regard to naming and your taxes and your you know EIN numbers and all that good stuff. And I think that's one of the things anybody that's gone through one of the uh, kind of DIY sites, the uh, you know, their kind of decision point flow chart sometimes maybe kind of neglects or overlooks some of that stuff that uh, that it may be much easier to uh, understand with the guidance of a, of a you know attorney working directly with them. And so that kind of brings me to my next point that we talked about. I think every business owner would love to say, well, let me run that by my lawyer. All right, but 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 the fear of cost. Cost, let's face it, is probably a big uh, reason for that. Because I know that uh, you know some people when they as soon as they get on the phone with their lawyer, they start looking at their clock and counting down. You know, every second that's that's costing me. Right. Well, you know, what what are some of those those, those kind of misconceptions, or maybe they're not misconceptions on the, the, the realities of of uh, you know the the cost of working directly with the attorney that that really understands your business and, and takes that time without necessarily, you know, uh, th- that uh, ticking away. Right. Yeah. Um, that That is exactly the reason why people are going to these, these DIY um, sites is because they want to avoid what they see as the expense, the costly expense of hiring a lawyer. But, um, uh, but, to, but in the end, um, what doing it on their own using those services can actually end up costing them much, much more, you know, on the other side than if they had just paid the lawyer in the first instance. So I am a huge proponent of the fact that every business owner, every entrepreneur needs to be working with an actual lawyer uh, to uh, to make sure that their uh, their legal structures and, and the foundation for their business is set up correctly. And, um, and I, I encourage business owners, you know, definitely you be, you have to be efficient. You have to come prepared. Um, but, um, but that can save you so much more in the end. And then, um, myself and other lawyers like me who are entrepreneurs ourselves, we understand that, um, that, yeah, getting on the phone with a lawyer sometimes is kind of like sitting in the cab, watching the meter run. Uh, they talk fast, you know, they say, I have three things I want to talk about. Um, but for me, I am about developing an ongoing relationship with my client. Um, and there are other lawyers uh, that are out there that are like me where I don't charge my clients, you know, if they're giving me a call and they, you know, have a problem or opportunity that they want to discuss, you know, we, I don't bill them for the call or the email coming in because I don't want them afraid to call me because they're afraid they're going to get a bill. So, um, so there are lawyers like that out there. It's a matter of working with the right lawyer, definitely. Uh, and I encourage small business owners even just to go to their local chamber of commerce. There are lawyers that are uh, that are there that are looking to help and support businesses. And usually through a chamber of commerce, you can get a free consultation. Uh, and that's a good starting point to sit down and, and have that, at least have that initial conversation with a lawyer where they can give you guidance if you're going to then uh, resort to using some sort of an online resource. Well, yeah, and that's a kind of, you know, you, you brought up about, um, uh, you know, that the, they can often come to regret it, you know, when something happens, because I guess a lot of these online sites aren't really there to defend you when something goes uh, uh, sideways. And 
And, uh, you know, you, you've practiced law for over 25 years and, and, uh, uh, defending just about it, all sizes of businesses against lawsuits um, there in Southern California. What do you see, you know, what's the one thing or maybe the common uh, things that they wished they had known uh, before they got there in that situation? Because I, I think a lot of people, when they start a business, they, they don't necessarily see themselves as that, that target um, but, uh, you know, the, that's, uh, I think a misconception that a lot of the public has, oh, it's a business. Uh, they got insurance there. Uh, that's a good, uh, that's a good target for, um, a lawsuit. So, you know, what are some of those common, uh, mistakes or, or things that they, they wish they'd known before they actually find themselves in court? Well, there's, <laughs> I could talk all day on that, Jack. <laughs> uh, <laughs> one of, uh, let's see. So one of the biggest ones in, in my mind is that in order for, uh, for you to have that personal liability protection while you're operating your business is that you do need a business entity, uh, such as an LLC or a corporation and, and right from the start. So, uh, sometimes, um, I've had, you know, entrepreneurs, they talk to their accountant, their accountant will say, okay, well, wait until you make X number of dollars. And then it'll justify, you know, the amount that you're paying for a franchise fee or, or, you know, some of the additional costs. But this is a big mistake because number one, those, um, I say it's like doing business naked, right? I mean, those businesses do not have anything protecting them from these, from the, the protecting their personal assets from a, a claim or, um, or a lawsuit. And, um, and they're missing out actually on kind of a hidden implication is the ability to develop corporate credit right from the start under the tax identification number for the new entity. Um, so I say it's a little bit like giving a college student a credit card. Uh, as soon as the entity uh, comes to be, you know, it doesn't have that credit history. But if you look at, you know, a lot of the more institutional lenders, you know, getting a line of credit or what have you, usually those banks are looking at a minimum of three years of financials. So if you wait to form the entity until after you've started doing business, you uh, you are not protected you uh, are you lose the opportunity to develop that that corporate credit. And also problematic is that a lot of the long-term contracts that you sign at the are at the beginning of your business, right? You're signing a lease, you're signing a franchise agreement, maybe some long-term client agreements. And all of those contracts are in your personal name uh, or a DBA, right? People come up with a fictitious name that they use. Um, but, but those contracts are very, very difficult to transfer into the, the entity once it's formed. I mean, if, if you think about it, it's like, look, you know, I've entered into this contract, I'm personally responsible, but, uh, will you, Mr. Landlord agree to let me transfer this long-term lease into, a, a, an entity that allows me to protect, you know, protect myself from you? <laughs> Who's going to do that? <laughs> no, that doesn't work. So, uh, so that's why it's so, so important to have the entity in place right from the start. And it's also important to uh, make sure you have the right entity. Like I talked earlier about, you know, you know, if you're a professional, you can't be an LLC in, in many, many instances, um, but also to maintain the entity. And this is something I see a lot is people are told, oh, you should be an S corp, for example, and an S corp is basically a tax election. It's a certain way for the entity to be taxed. So they form a, you know, a corporate structure. Uh, and the corporate structure, you know, you have your bylaws and your stock certificates and, and, and legally, you know, there are, you know, the shareholders, even in a, in a corporation in which there's one person, you as the shareholder are supposed to have an annual meeting where you elect yourself as a director and then you appoint yourself as the president, secretary, treasurer, right? So people are like, it's so silly. It's just me. Why do I do these things? And so when they, you know, they set up this corporate structure, they don't, sometimes they use those services. They, they receive the kit in the mail. They don't even fill in the blanks sometimes. <laughs> um, or, 
uh, or they don't, you know, maintain what are these, what are called corporate formalities of having these annual meetings, documenting their meetings in corporate minutes. And, um, and so we have people who come to us having used those services that they think they have an entity structure in place. They have really nothing more than, you know, an entity on, on record with a secretary of state. And the reason that matters is that if you get sued uh, for a claim relating to your business and you want to rely upon that, that protection that that entity is supposed to provide to you, then you need to have maintained that entity separate from yourself. Uh, if you haven't done that, then the person suing you can make a claim that you are what's called the alter ego of your entity and that as you have failed to maintain its its and respected its separate legal existence, then they should also be allowed to disregard that uh, separate legal protection and access your personal assets. And that's the concept of piercing the the veil of protection. So you're saying a lot of people that have used those services after a couple of years have really just spent a lot of money on a thick book and a corporate seal. Yeah, I mean, I I recently had recently had a doctor come to me, and she told me that her accountant had formed her corporation for her, and um, and so what we offer as as a service to our clients is we offer our clients an annual corporate package. You know, it's five hundred dollars a year, it includes registered agent services, complimentary consultation, and we prepare those minutes. So I said to her, great, your accountant, put your entity together where, you know, we were at your first year here, we're going to, you know, be doing your minutes for this year. I said, send me what you already have. uh, So, you know, we can get your files set up. So she sends me over all of her corporate documents, which apparently her accountant, you know, sent her a book, which is basically what you get, you know, this binder, which is what you get when you go online by yourself or, you know, what have you. And it was completely blank. The stock certificates weren't issued. You know, there was no, no initial meeting minutes or anything like that. And I told her, I said, basically I have to start over, (laughs) you know? Uh, So, and I see that so, so often, or I see a lot of family owned businesses uh, in particular where they've been doing business for a number of years and they have their corporate binder and they bring it to me and there's nothing for years and years and years where there are no document, no documents of any kind. And so in those cases, what we do is we sort of backtrack a little bit, clean it up, because if you're sued, and, and by the way, I was a litigator for the first 10 years of my career, exclusively defending businesses in lawsuits. And if you're sued, the very first thing that the um, that the lawyer on the other side is going to ask you for is copies of your corporate documents, your bylaws, your stock certificates, and those sorts of things, because they know that most small businesses do not keep up with those sorts of things, or even know that they're supposed to, and uh, and it's the easiest way for them to make a claim that should they should be allowed to pierce through that veil of protection to get through to your personal assets. So, um, so that said, I, I will say my favorite entity is an LLC. I love them. I think they are great because the main uh, document in an LLC is what's called the operating agreement. It is a wonderful place to um, to include all of your partnership terms if you have a partnership. Um, but also, you don't have to maintain, you know, annual meetings and different things like that. So, my preferred structure is an LLC. And if my clients' tax advisors tell them that they need to have that S corporate tax election, uh, what many don't realize is that you can have an LLC structure taxed as an S corp. So you get the flexibility of the LLC structure while taking advantage of the tax benefits of the S corporate tax election. Well, I think there's probably a lot of small business owners listening to this right now thinking, oh my, I think I have a problem. (laughs) Because I think a lot of them have those big empty books um, that they kind of put away thinking, okay, I've I've set my structure. Now it's time to move on to other things. Um, So I know that, like you said, you probably talk for hours 
<laughs> on on uh, this, but I want to uh, also get into, uh, you know, even after you've you set up your business, right, and and you know, say you've you've set your structure, and that's all set. Well, then there's just the day to day legal issues, if not day to day, week to week, month to month. Uh, most businesses have to deal with whether it's contracts, um, employment, and then uh, gosh, in today's world uh, seems like you know, br- bringing on uh, employees uh, has its own world of issues um, as well. And then there's also businesses that want to protect what they've created through through, through uh, uh, trademarks. So, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to get into a, a few of um, those issues. And, uh, you know, out of that, out of those that I mentioned, which one of those do you think is uh, the ones that, that businesses that, that seems to crop up most often? All of them. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, look, you're running a business, right? And um, I, I, I I serve as, as general counsel to my clients, which basically means I take a holistic approach and we look at all of those issues. So the entity is just the first step. Definitely. And you, like I said, you want to make sure it's set up correctly. But then once the entity is formed, then for example, if you pick a name for your business, this is another thing we see a lot. So you pick a name for your business, the domain's available, so it must be okay to use. <laughs> no, not necessarily, right? So um, so you should do a preliminary evaluation before you get too excited about that name. You know, there are a lot of really cute, clever names out there that have already already been registered by someone else. And so you don't, as an entrepreneur, don't want to get too far down the line with using a particular name that then you're going to have someone send you a cease and desist letter and you need to start over. But, um, but that said, then usually, you know, you want to make sure your intellectual property, your trademarks and your copyrights are owned by the entity. And, um, and then as you start to grow, um, you know, I'm a huge believer that you should have a customized contract for your business. I see a lot of entrepreneurs, they either take a contract from someone else in their industry or heaven forbid, they download a template. I say, it's like taking someone else's medicine. It may work for one person. It may not necessarily work for you. Um, and again, in those, in those instances, I say, look, you know, do your research, put together, you know, the contract terms that you like from what you see, but then sit down and have that contract reviewed by an, by a lawyer before you hand it to someone to sign. Because if you hand that contract to someone to sign and there's a dispute and either there's something in there that you weren't aware of, um, sometimes it's what's not in the contract that can really bite you. Or there's what's called an ambiguity, meaning a reasonable person can read it one of two ways. Then if it's your contract, then it's construed against you. So um, so contracts are really important. And then another thing I see a lot is small business owners want, want to hire independent contractors. They want to avoid hiring employees. They want to avoid the, you know, the issues that go along with that. But primarily here in the state of California, and unfortunately it's coming across the country, is the concept of virtually every person you hire to perform any service related to your business is presumed to be your employee. And you need to meet certain criteria either within your state or even just at the IRS level has their own test for who qualifies as an independent contractor. And uh, so a big big, very costly mistake I see are small business owners hiring what they are calling independent contractors that are truly employees. And uh, and that can be very, very costly by what's called a misclassification. Either the employee makes a claim against you saying that they were misclassified or the contractor makes a claim against you claiming they were a misclassified employee, or the government um, comes after you to say that you've been misclassifying independent contractors and so are responsible for back taxes and penalties and a lot of nasty things. Yeah, I can imagine that because I I guess probably a lot of employers think that the quickest way to, to, uh, you know, get someone working is do an independent contractor because, you know, they're unsure of, of, you know, the stability of, of their business or that, um, well, but yeah, just the implications of 
the, the taxes they have to pay and, and other things that go along with that. Um, do you see that as the biggest reason why they go that route? Because it's the, they, they see it as the quickest and, and, and simplest, or is there some other kind of myths or misconceptions around, you know, when someone's an employee or when somebody's a, a independent contractor? Well, I think, you know what, I think that there's a lot of um, misunderstandings on both sides of that coin. So you have small businesses that want to avoid the cost and complexity of hiring an employee. And um, and sometimes I have small business owners that, you know, are hiring someone and they, they want to, to do things the right way. So they want to make that person an employee. And the person they're hiring says, oh, no, I want to be an independent contractor. And, um, and I always say the bottom line is you, you really don't get to choose the person, you know, who chooses is the government and the government's going to tell you that this person is in fact an employee. So what I tell small business owners is, look, if you're not in a position where you're ready to hire an employee and we help our clients with handbooks and compliance and all that good stuff, which is, we can talk about some more, but if you're not in that position and you want to hire someone as an independent contractor, then at a minimum, and there are all kinds of factors in these different types of tests, but at a minimum, whoever you hire should have their own business entity, such as an LLC or corporation. Do not hire a sole proprietor because they can make a personal claim against you. You need to have a contract that states that that, per that, that person is an independent contractor. You want to hire uh, someone who is doing work for other people, that they advertise that they're doing work for other people. And ideally, that uh, and legally here in the state of California, uh, that that person is providing a service that is different from the services you offer within your own business. Ah, so it's pretty tough to uh, hire a independent contractor sandwich maker, right? For if you if you own a restaurant. Exactly. <laughs> I got you. That's right. Yeah. So the and here in California, we have um, a three part test an ABC test, if you will. Um, everyone, is, so the first the first element is always control, right? So people say, well, I'm not controlling them or they're only working, you know, a couple of hours. The number of hours, it does not matter. And 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 the traditional concept of not controlling their activities is, is a given. But then the other factors, you know, here, in, so part A in California is that you don't control what they do. Part B is that they're providing a service that's outside the ordinary course of your business. And part C, that they have their own independently established trader business in this in the same providing the same services that um, that they're providing to you. So an example is, uh, you know, you have a yoga studio, you have a yoga instructor. You know, it's like apples, apples, apples to oranges. <laughs> yeah. uh, that is that is a an employee, and historically many. Um, you know, yoga studios, fitness studios, um, dance studios always would hire their instructors as independent contractors because those instructors were quite often working for other studios. But um, but that is one area in particular in particular that was impacted by all of these laws. But basically, saying your your instructors are your employees. Uh, so so like in the case of the restaurant. You, you, you couldn't necessarily have an independent contractor chef, but uh, an independent contractor that comes and power washes your your parking lot, if they do that for other people as well. Would that be kind of a, a simplistic example? Exactly. Perfect. Yes. Yeah. Your right. plumber, you, you know, your uh, a little trickier would be like, you know, your website designer, uh, you know, someone like that, as long as they have their own outside agency. Again, I always say work with someone who has their own entity. Sometimes if you have someone on your staff that does the basic marketing for you, uh, then there's, and if they're only working for you and they're going to your location and they're working on your equipment, that person may be your, uh, your employee. I gotcha. So yeah, it's, um, it seems like nothing is cut and dry and, uh, I, I know it's probably, uh, one of the biggest, uh, one of the jokes in the, both the, the legal and, uh, and uh, I guess, accounting world is, I guess, the most common answer is always, it depends. That seems to be the the uh, the big answer, and and that's where you have to really start digging in. Um, 
because it depends. It seems like it shouldn't be so complicated, but it, 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 it certainly is. Um, one other area that I wanted to ask you about is uh, businesses when it comes to uh, especially you know, businesses with a storefront when it comes to where they're, they're doing business. Um, and the real estate, do you, I guess, help businesses with that, you know, sorting out leases or even purchasing property for their business, that uh, type of thing? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so if we have business clients who are, yeah, if they're renting spaces, we help them with their commercial leases uh, if we have, you know, medical healthcare providers, we help them with their, with their leasing. Sometimes they're subletting to other professionals, so we help with all of that. Um, and we do recommend, you know, as 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 you grow, uh, yeah, considering buying the property that you are using for your business. Um, even and also with a lot of people now who are buying investment properties, like uh, you know, they're take they're buying properties and doing Airbnb or what have you, uh, you know. I recommend that you put your separate commercial property into a separate LLC, not a corporation for tax reasons, um, but you put it into an LLC. And so, for example, I work with a lot of dentists. Uh, and, and so dentists, because their um, their facilities involve a lot of complexities with water lines and different things like that. So buying the building is actually a great investment strategy. So I recommend that they buy the building in, a, in an LLC. Then they have a professional corporation for their dental practice, and then they lease their dental practice, their dental corporation leases that property from, from the LLC. So it's a good way to separate um, from a liability perspective. You don't want to put your high value assets in the same shell, if you will, as um, as as some of with some of your riskier business activities and um, and separating out the real estate into a separate entity is a great way to do that. Well, I think one of the things that's, that's really refreshing about this conversation is that I would imagine there's a lot of businesses, like you talked about, family-owned businesses that, boy, we have just really messed this up and, and you know, we've gone 10 years, we have an empty book, and maybe they're they're embarrassed about the, uh, the what they've uh, created, but it sounds like, uh, you know, you truly do have an, an understanding and empathy um, for what they're going through. And also it sounds like you, there, there's, there's a solution, uh, uh, to it. Do you have uh, clients that come to you that, you know, maybe with their head down low, like you know, they don't really want to show you what they have and, 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 you know, what, what would you say to people that, that may feel like I've, I've let this go too far. I'm just going to take my chances. Yeah. I, I, I have had people come to me, you know, saying I'm embarrassed or don't laugh at my contract <laughs> or um, I've had someone sit down. I remember one time that someone sat down with unopened, a stack of unopened letters from the uh, employment development department, right? They were afraid to open the envelopes. Um, but it's, it's like anything, the longer you wait, the worse it's going to get. And so, um, and there's always a solution and, you know, and, and I think that that's something that, you know, I've been practicing law over 25 years and something that I'm, you know, frankly, I'm really good at is I sit down and we see what we're dealing with and we just, you know, take it apart piece by piece and put, you know, put the pieces back in the correct order. So there's nothing that can't be undone. You know, there's nothing that we can't either. Sometimes if there's a situation where the entities just got, you know, liabilities, you know, shut it down and, and call it quits. Um, start over. And sometimes, you know, I say, well, there's, we'll just clean it up and move forward. So um, there, there is always, always a way through, but, um, but you just cannot turn away and, and pretend like, like it's going to get better because it isn't some heaven forbid, you know, you have an entity structure where it's not properly documented and someone dies or someone gets a divorce or you have a partner who decides that they're going to lock you out of the, they're going to lock you out of this, the restaurant and empty the bank accounts. You know, it's like you just need to get things in place and make sure that, um, that things are done the right way. Well, uh, one of the things I, I want to, um, uh, ask you about, uh, before we go, uh, if you don't mind is, is that, uh, besides working directly with your business clients, 
uh, you've also created uh, some different products and programs, uh, some you know educational material that help entrepreneurs and business owners with um, with some of the issues that we've been talking about. Can you uh, kind of go into that a little deeper or give an overview on on what that looks like? Yeah, absolutely. I am. It's just so, so important to me to educate business owners. And so I'm always working on ways to to get in, you know, to get the information to the business owners uh, in in the best way possible. So um, I do have a, a, an ebook, a free ebook that I wrote, the top five legal mistakes business owners make. And, and I told you earlier, if they text uh, biz law to 26786, biz law to 26786, they'll get that report. And that, um, that helps them to at least identify at a high level, um, kind of what, what they should be looking for. And then I'm in the process right now of launching and creating, launching a, uh, a digital course on the five W's of contracts, because many of my clients want a simple contract, uh, and, uh, and, or they're using these online services. And at a minimum, I want them to know, you know, what to be looking out for. I'm uh, putting together a bundle of courses on, you know, the, the thing, the top five things you need to know with regard to a trademark, the top five things you need to know when hiring an independent contractor. So, uh, so if they, if they, you know, send that text to, uh, to um, two, six, seven, eight, six, then they'll, they'll be able to get more information when that, when those courses are launched um, and then I, I'm a regular speaker. I'm always happy to come. And I speak to many chambers of commerce, associations, and different things like that to be able to, to talk to people. And then lastly, I have put together a, a legal services program. It's called the Legal Essentials for Business Owners. That is um, actual legal services. At a, it includes what I believe are your essentials, the a trademark, a contract, um, a, an entity, and uh, and it's a flat amount per month, so you as a business owner have are able to predict, you know, kind of what your legal fees are. And my programs include ongoing access to uh, to our lawyers and our team here at uh, Chase Law Group. And that also provides the ability for you to be able to say with confidence, "Let me run that by my attorney." Always. And every time I hear, yeah, anytime my clients say that, you know, oh, I'm going to, I told them I'm going to call my attorney. I, I, they feel good and I really feel good for them. Well, I can tell you, you, you can hear your passion that you have for what you do. Um, so I have to ask, you know, well, what is it that fuels that passion? What is it that that, that led you to, to do this type of law and help the, the, the types of businesses that you help? You know, it all it all started with my dad. So my dad, um, you know, I, I grew up in a very blue collar background. My dad worked for General Motors, um, and you know, and he worked hard. He worked on the assembly line, and uh, you know, to bring food home and and to support our family. But uh, but he was always an entrepreneur. He always came home with all these different ideas, and I think it's just kind of something that that I picked up along the way. And after you know. I went to college and went to law school and all that good stuff. But when I, when I graduated and I started, um, you know, I stepped into a job that paid, I worked in a big law firm, uh, defending businesses that were being sued in, I say in virtually every courthouse in Southern California and, um, and just starting and really seeing, you know, in, in very difficult ways, a lot of the mistakes that these business owners were making. And by the time, I would be defending them in court. What's done is done. You know, the emails are sent, the the entities are in place or not, the contracts are signed. So, um, so I had a change in life when you know I got married and started my family, and I didn't want to be in courthouses and and all those sorts of things. So I started my practice in 2007, so about 15 years ago, a little over that, and um. And really, my passion is to help these business owners to get these structures in place before the lawsuit's filed. Because once the lawsuit's filed, it's really damage control. So um, so I'm passionate about that. I'm an entrepreneur myself. I always have my own ideas. I, I myself, I'm buying domains all the time. 
(laughs) (laughs) And, uh, you know, I just the other day said to my mom, Hey mom, I have this idea for this, this kind of this new product. And, and she said, wow, you really sound like your father, you know? (laughs) So, uh, so that's me. Well, I think that's probably one of the benefits your clients have is, is somebody that really does understand, empathize, and uh, can be an enthusiastic about what they are, are going through in, in, in their journey. So um, I, I have to, uh, to thank you for coming on and, and sharing this. I think uh, it's really opened eyes to a lot of uh, issues that people may not realize that they're facing, but it's also, I think, given people hope that, that the thing, man, I, I, I really made a mistake and not sure that it's fixable, but, um, definitely giving them hope. So I, I have to thank you for, for coming on and, and sharing this. It's been a pleasure. It really has been. So last question, how can people find out more about Deanne Chase and, uh, to get involved and, and, um, at the least, you know, follow you and, and take advantage of, of, uh, Uh, some of this education that you're providing? Sure. Well, um, like I said earlier, if they uh, wanted to get that that free ebook, they can text BizLaw to 26786. That's B-I-Z-L-A-W. They can um, check out our website, chaselawmb.com. That's MB for Manhattan Beach, California. That's where I'm located. They can call our office, 310-545-7700. And I'm on social media, uh, Chase Law Group on Instagram and Chase Law Group on Facebook. So just look for me. All right. Well, again, thank you so much for coming on and um, uh, sharing this. We'll, we'll have those links on our show post. Great. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed talking with you. Oh, uh, me as well. My pleasure. All right, folks. There you have it. Definitely check out D and Chase. Like I said, we'll have those links right there on the show post for you to uh, be able to download your free, uh, the ebook, the top five legal mistakes ebook, as well as to find out more about uh, Deanne and to uh, connect on social media until next time on influencers radio. Remember you are the only real game changer. You've been listening to Influencers Radio. To get all past shows and updates on future shows, visit InfluencersRadio.com today. 